Hey, everybody. I am here with Grant, a.k.a. Stemage. How's it going, man? Oh, it's going great. Happy to be here, man. I am very excited to talk to you. I've been a fan of yours for a long time now. I'm geeking out a bit that uh, I get to be chatting with you here. So, uh, you know, I'm glad I got the name right, too. Knowing my luck, you're actually, you pronounce it Stemage. So I'm glad I got Stemage right. No, I like <laughs> saying I, say, I like saying it's garbage, but with a stem, you know? I've That's heard pretty funny. Uh, the the big joke is stay uh, that a friend on the forums <laughs> coined years ago. So that's still ringing in my ears. I'll take it. I like it. I'll take I it. I like it. <laughs> so uh, 2008, 2009, I'm wandering around a warehouse that my company was uh, was using to manufacture computers, and I hear metal coming from the back. And we're in Statesville, North Carolina. It's mostly country and whatever else they had. So I was like, who the fuck's listening to metal? And some nerdy kid comes around the corner and he's like, me. And I'm like, oh, shit. You know, it's interesting to find another metalhead around here. So I'm chatting with him for a bit. And he just immediately nerds out on like, have you heard the new Death Clock album? I'm like, I don't know what that is, which I do now, but whatever. He's like, yeah. have you heard Metroid Metal? I went, what are you talking about? Stop. Back up. And he's like, you don't even know what I'm talking about? So he just gave me the website and everything. Went back to my hotel room that night, downloaded it, and I have been absolutely hooked ever since. I've been following you. Um, I never got to see your band play live because I, I, at any of the trade shows, the job I used to have, they used to send me all over. So it was rare I got to be wherever I wanted to be. But yeah, yeah I just um, I, I, absolutely awesome renditions of some of the best video game music that I've ever heard, in my opinion. So it like... What is that origin story? What, how did you decide to do that? And then how did you get it to sound so freaking good, you know, 15 years ago or whatever? Because oh, man, technology has I mean, gotten a lot better recently than it was for recording back then. Oh, that's for sure. I mean, I, you know, it's funny. This I just celebrated the 20th anniversary of uploading the first MP3 of, of Metroid Metal to the Internet. So it goes back to the it goes back to the analog four track. You know, it's like the. Mm -hmm. The tape days, uh, my my the first the whole first NES, um, I guess I call it album, but it was just a song at a time back then. You know, it was just it was, we I didn't have a website. It was just recording a quick version of an idea to share on the IGN boards, um, and it was on the Tascam cassette high bias eight track. It was, it was like uh, you know, no cutting and pasting. All had to be programmed ahead of time in my little Yamaha drum machine, and and uh, and then things you know, evolved. And I ended up getting my buddy chunk style to play bass on stuff, which meant I had to go to the computer. I had to start using cool edit pro, which is something that I'd used in college. Uh, <coughs> and then, you know, fast forward to about 2009. That's, that's what you said. That's when the band got together. We, I just, we discovered Magfest and realized there were other like-minded nerds that could play way better than us. So we pulled them in and we were like, we're like, let's, let's see if we could do this live. And, and, um, hooked up with Danimal from Arm Cannon and Kirby from Temp Sound Solutions and uh, Kevin, a, a drummer that we knew from other projects and made the band happen uh, and then it could actually have shows. And then it's just been, you know, playing playing the occasional trade show, like you said. I mean, we don't play as often as, as much anymore, but we did have sort of a, not really a reunion show, but just sort of a freshen up uh, at this last MAGFest and, and had a great time. So um, we don't play a lot, but we, re we, st we don't tour together. We don't play a ton. Maybe that's why we still enjoy playing music mm. together. We don't do it too much. You're from the band scene. You know what that's like. You, you know, it's, it's a, it's a family, right? Um, yeah. The grind got me more than anything else. The grind yeah. of like showing up at the bar and then they're changing the time you go on. And you're there early with a smile on your face to try to be that hard worker, but then you get taken advantage of. And now you've been there for eight hours. You know, you've spent all of your money at the bar, but somehow are still completely boringly sober. And then now you're playing a gig to the bartender and the bouncer who just wants you to leave or finish so they could leave. It's, I had I had enough of those. Yep. And, uh, you know, they were worth it. They were absolutely worth it to get to the ones where I'm playing in front of a couple hundred people going to hell. I don't deserve to be here. Like, yeah, the hell? Right. this is amazing. Like, yeah, that was a, not it is every a night. It is a <laughs> grind. It's it's yeah. something. It's it's like, and if you're in a metal band, it is exactly what you just described. I mean, that's that's what it is. It's you're playing in 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 shoeboxes and puddles in the floor kind of places. And and there's some great people at those places, and there's been some great shows. But you always, you know, you always kind of you got to fight through the bad ones to get the good ones. Make for great yeah. stories, though. You know. 
and the people with their hands out, how many promoters couldn't make big enough oh, air prom- quotes, wanted promoters. to take money from me. And I'm just like, I wanted to pull them aside and be like, you know, take me a long time to work through my anger issues. Would you like to see them come back out? Because yeah, exactly. I know exactly what you're trying to do to me right now. So please just walk away. Yeah. yeah. You don't know what kind of metal band you might be dealing with. Maybe just, you know, try to scam someone else. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It was frustrating. We we but, played a, we played some smaller shows, um, more local type stuff, but they were all the Metroid Metal Group. But they were always um, they're, they're always like smaller cons. We did Asheville uh, Comic Expo. Hmm. Um, we've done like it's like nerd music themed stuff, which by default will at least pull out nerds who are interested in hearing really any kind of music as long as it's nerdy. You might yeah. there might be it might be a three band bill and it's a four string quartet, a nerdcore group. And a metal band, and I don't, I don't know of a lot of other scenes where that can happen seamlessly, you know, and it feels natural. But it's, it's really cool. Yeah, I, I love, you know, it's funny because metal, uh, you do get the meatheads, and I am the biggest freaking metalhead on the planet. So when I say this, I say that with honesty. But you do get the meatheads that are like, if you listen to metal, you can listen to only metal, and nothing else but metal. And it's, that's that's so the minority in that scene. I grew up listening to gangster rap metal and then whatever pop music i listened to and <clears throat> depending what um substances i was experimenting with at the time i could go from listening to slayer to aqua to yeah. you know to like wu-tang clan so it's you know yeah it's i, I think most of us are actually like that so. yeah that's where the good music comes from if you're just inspired by other metal bands you're just going to sound like a metal band you know you gotta you gotta things are going to keep changing you gotta let you gotta broaden your horizons you know yeah um and uh, after the uh, we put out our last stupid album, one of my friends was like, oh, "I didn't know you were a fan of Heart." And I'm like, "I mean, yeah, but no, but I mean, obviously, a great songs, great musicians, but I've never bought an album." And they're like, "Well, isn't that little interlude part before the solo crazy for you?" And I'm like, "No, it's god damn it, it's crazy for you." <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's uh. Yeah. You get yep. your influences from everywhere. That happens. I have I have blatantly stolen or borrowed. I don't know. I'm not giving them back parts from all <laughs> kinds of different songs. And I mean, in in specifically the Metroid Metal stuff, I can point to where things came from just because it's like you you can't help it. It's in your blood. There's so many Stone Temple Pilots chords and <laughs> Metroid Metal music. I can't. I, it's just it's just how it is. Some of the mathy stuff, you know, pulling from from Dream Theater stuff to sleepy tom gorilla museum or other weird prog it just happens you know sometimes it's on purpose and sometimes it's like why is this riff really good it's probably because it's a helmet riff you know yeah but, I, but i'm not entirely sure and then you you play for someone else to to you know get their opinion but i had a couple like that the retro rgb theme song was one where uh, the person in the band that was writing all the songs with me and sent me or i found on their youtube channel just like a, an old old demo they did that was just four chords but the vocal melody was really cool and it was the only time in my life that this ever happened but i i'm listening to this song i get 10 seconds in and my my brain just went and it's the theme song that's for all my videos now and i just i for a while i was just asking everybody like Hey, what song is this? And yes. was like, I don't know. It's kind of catchy, but I was like, there's no way I could have written that. It's impossible. It just came to me out of nowhere. So, yeah, no, that that was the only time it ever happened. That was you're awesome. safe. You're yep. safe so far. Love it. So, um, since we do have a lot of music nerds listening, obviously, mean that one would love. Um, go back to that task cam recorder and go back to that drum machine so were you actually programming the drums and then what was the bass was that a digital bass or was that actually you and playing a bass plugged in like how did all this and and also what do you the first song that you actually remember doing with the intent of doing it like oh i'm gonna redo this this video game song yeah so uh i yes it it was it was definitely the 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 task cam eight track with my um sm57 propped up in a new balance shoe because it was that was the sweet spot of my my delta blues amp it was like the right angle right closeness it was like that it was a, it was a shoe on top of a shoebox lid was perfect uh i i did that um with my i have this little yamaha r it was called an ry10 rhythm programmer but it was just one of the earlier yamaha drum machines and i got it i probably got that thing when i was in like 
I don't know, maybe eighth or ninth grade. And it had one drum kit that I liked a lot. The rest of them were pretty terrible, but it had one good crash, one good open hi-hat, and I just did all the programming ahead uh, in that. It wasn't until later that I, I ran out of room. I did the boss medley for Super Metroid, which is like seven minutes long. And I actually had to record, I had to arrange half the song and then wipe the memory of the drum machine and then arrange the other half of the song, which was a very scary thing because you can't oh. really go back at that point and, yeah. and do anything about it. But that's just also the nature of the analog days, right? I mean, that's, you're just going to go back and have to program it, program it again anyway. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was the same uh, carving guitar that I play now, and it was a beater bass that my family had. We sort of went in and had like a, a little wash burn that we just, with a no fear sticker on it, we got, you know, at the local shop. And I just used that. And uh, I think my, my thinking around that, the first uh, Metroid track I put up, which was the first game arrangement I had done, I, I was a big fan of the mini bosses and the Neskimos, uh, the one ups. And I was like, I wondered what it would be like to first for a, for a, I tried to envision a band that might just exist, but it happened to be Metroid instead of just doing a straight cover of a Metroid track. It's like, what if I took some really fun riff ideas and then just sort of lay the melody on top? So you're sort of, there's a lot of songwriting involved in that, but just write a new rhythm track, right? And make the melody fit. And that, I sort of stayed that way. There's a lot of stuff in, in my, Metroid arrangements specifically that are just not Metroid at all. It's just got it's got some of the chords and some of the melodies, but it's all it's kind of a re envisioning, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the idea, and I, not everyone really either got it or enjoyed it. But it, I mean, it didn't matter. It was for me no agenda with this project, no no intent on getting views because who's going to view it? It's the internet pre YouTube, right? It's just like get put it up and share it for fun. Um, and so yeah, that was sort of my my thinking. And then when when people there was a pretty positive response, and I and only because I had already thought about a few different tracks, there were other ones I wanted to to do. I wanted to do something swinging. I wanted to do Brinstar, right? It's got a it's mm. got a nice gallop to it. So I just kind of kept going, uh, putting a song up every you know three months or so, uh, and stuck with that a track for a long time. I don't have it with me, I, but when I moved. Out west, I left it with my brother. It's in like a sealed up case, and it's got all I've got all the tapes and all the band demos and everything. All the cassettes are still there. Uh, I don't even know how to properly archive that because I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't know how to do that because when you you can't dump stem at a time because there's not consistency in the tape speed, so nothing really would line up if I did that. But uh, all those all all the tape is still out there. I, I just need to figure out if I want to remix it or do something with it. Uh, but. Yeah, and there are some half un there are some half finished songs, some ideas I thought I might come back to, but I ended up changing direction anyway. Um, but yeah, it was all gorilla, you know, the floor of your bedroom recording uh, for a long time. So, what's the workflow like today then? Yeah, I mean today, I mean I don't know the last time that I mic'd my amp. Um, I mean I, I I've done it on occasion, and I think like the hardest thing is that you don't get. I love feedback. I love harmonics. I like things kind of screaming back. And it, it, if I want that, I've really got to plug in to get that. Um, but now it's all in the box. I mean, it's all. I, I can play drums, but I don't play them. And I'll and I I'll, I'll, I have like electronic kit, and I will play around to get ideas. But I I, I end up just sequencing drums. I go and. I humanize them as much as I can. I'm always like trying to program in mistakes and extra hits and uh, things like that. But it's like, it's all in the box. It's like tracking in a DAW, which, you know, I think you have a tendency to, 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 to trace when you do that, like lay it, lay a game song in there and just play what you hear. I try to stay away from that. I like the, the method of planning ahead and, tr and tracking um, mm. without just copying every single note as you do it. Um, or as you as you hear it but um, yeah I don't know I'm trying to keep it old school in a way but it's definitely like unlimited tracks unlimited VSTs you know t got all kinds of options available so uh, it's a different world lots changed in 20 years yeah I um, I really love the balance of things nowadays because I do understand you know <clears throat> and I'm, I'm talking for me I'm not talking for every other musician but you know Jamming with a drummer in real time to get that drum track would be the most ideal scenario. So not really to a click, but realistically, you know, who has the studio, who has the money for that studio time, right? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, recording a demo 
on guitar, sending that to the drummer, having them record the drums, and then everything just directly into my Motu M4. <clears throat> and then for, I mean, for me now, I'm not, you know, the, the band isn't active. I'm not doing anything. So I would have my friend put it through his plugins that today sound wildly different than they did in 2015, the last time we used plugins. But if I ever had like a budget, if I had a small budget, I would actually want to use a Kemper. Uh, and then yeah. if I had a bigger budget, I would still want to go direct into my computer, but then actually reamp with the mic in front of the amp and everything else. Yep. So, right. Yeah. That's so kind, of, kind the, of the best of both, you know? Yeah. I think that that's, um, that is ideal. I mean, there's nothing like a really good room with a really good kit in it. Uh, I'm always chasing my favorite bands, drum sounds, um, with like whatever drum VST is, is the thing at the time. And I, I can't quite get there. And it's, and it's not, it's not even the quality of the drum. It's, it's everything from, you know, for a snare hit, you know, if you hit, if you hit a snare really hard and you hit a snare just a little bit, very different timbres, very different mm -hmm. characters. You can't just take a loud snare drum hit and turn the volume down. It doesn't work that way. And right. I recently tried some, um, uh, Kurt Ballou, who is in the band Converge and is a really good, good producer. He has incredible drum sounds and he did a drum library. And I'm like, I love his drums. I love Kaven. Kaven is one of my favorite metal bands. I want to make Kaven sounding drums. I got his plug in and it just didn't have enough versatility. It sounded pretty good, but now I'm just kind of back to what I'm used to using. So I'm always sort of banging my head against that. I, I want to have like a drummer available and have the studio to be able to, 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 to track that stuff, but it's not available. So it's all, it's about getting as close as I can, you know? Mm. Um, I, um, yeah. I'm not a drummer. I love drums, but, uh, I can't play, but I could hear triggers. <clears throat> it's yeah. a weird thing. And I'm not, you know, if that's the sound that you're going for, awesome. But I just, I, I've heard different bands and different arrangements. And I'm like, it almost sounds like you didn't even play the notes. It almost sounds like you just used a drum machine, even though I know the drummer is ridiculously good, you know, top 1% on the planet. It doesn't, it doesn't really bring it out. It sounds like something I could program. It doesn't sound like a drummer drummer, you know? Yeah, I think that the the tendency now is to track a really good drummer and then quantize them and then yeah. sample replace them. So you're essentially turning them into a drum machine. I, I've, I feel like I'm in this weird place where I, or at least I try to work backwards. I'll, I, I program it in first and then I had H in Reaper and humanize as much as I can. I move things off a little bit just to create a bit of a human element. I've had people, I've had drummers tell me that they, they want to know who who's plays drums on a track and that is the best possible compliment i could get is that i fooled a drummer because that's hard well, can we just back up real quick because we do have a lot of people listening that might not have actually ever been in a studio or recorded or anything sure. so when you're talking about humanize you're talking about when you digitally program a set of drums as if they were a real drummer but it's you programming it in and then you use humanize to make it feel it you're not you're not messing with a drummer's performance with that with that plugin, right? Correct. You're looking at like a you're looking at the equivalent of sheet music, but it's a it's a MIDI. It's a it's called the piano roll, but it's essentially just a visualization of all the MIDI notes um, that you're using to trigger these drum samples. And when you put them in, that you know you're you're putting them in on the staff. They're they're locked to the lines. Well, when you when you go back in, you can uh, the best drummer in the world is not going to be dead on um, in mm -hmm. his performance. And so my 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 hope is to go and try to put that. Hum try to humanize that sort of sterile performance that I've clicked into my computer. Go back in and try to move things off a little bit. Make a drum, make a tom fill be a little sloppy because that's how they do it. Um, you know, if you're doing a, a series of snare hits, try to move them all off from each other because it's not going to be dead on. Mm. Um, just to make it sound like the bands I like, you know, that have real drummers yeah. that don't go through and do that stuff. Yeah. You know, we <clears throat> we were told that we were not going to be used, using plugins or uh, uh, triggers on the album, and then they ended up using them, and it really pissed me off because the drummer was great. But mm. we had a couple people say, "Well, you know, uh, the song's good and all, but that part at the end, if you're going to program something like that, you should program something that people could actually play." Here's the video of this chick doing this in real time, asshole. This is a real drummer doing it really like here it is for reals in the room with my iPhone. Not like oh, I used to get so mad about that. But they they weren't wrong in that it sounded fake, but they were wrong in that a real person played it. So Yeah, that's too bad. I, I, I know what you're talking about. I hear some of these like some of these techie bands and they just it just sounds like what something you program. 
they can really they can some drummers can really play that stuff and and yeah. uh when you go and you remove all of the the nuance and the mistakes and the human element that makes them makes their performance sound organic it just it just makes them sound like a drum machine um i yeah. feel like it's i feel like it's i don't know i guess there's reasons to do that and your different genres of music call for different things but it's not what i want to hear really and we're not I, even dream theater. They were just talking about one pretty cool double bass part that I think most drummers who practiced could do. It's not like we were doing, you know, you know, a math problem on drums. So yeah, it was. But still, I don't like the fake sound, and I definitely don't like quantizing. <clears throat> I, we told the producer, absolutely, do not quantize. If you need us to re-record anything, we'll do it. And he did it once, and not only did I immediately hear it, but then it screwed up another part. And I oh, was like, no. don't ever touch that shit again. <laughs> But unfortunately, my attitude towards that went back to bite me because I was obsessing so hard over the hard parts that there's a, one song where it's, you know, the opening and the middle parts. And I was obsessing so hard over the really complicated stuff that like a month after the album came out, I was like, I got one of the it's wrong. Like, oh, <laughs> crap, I should have copied and pasted from another one. Like, I don't, that's the copy and paste moment. Something a year one guitar student could do flawlessly. If I flubbed that in a recording, fine, copy and paste it from the previous one. But like sure. something that actually took talent and effort and years for me to try to figure out how to do. No, 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 don't don't touch that. If I don't yeah. get it right, that's that's a reflection of how good I could possibly be in that moment. But like, a dun -dun -dun, like, oh, yeah. damn it. That's it where happens. copy and paste should have been there. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, it happens. Um, yeah, I don't know. I go, I go back and forth on the, on the. There's so many production tricks now, and you got to be careful. I, I mean, it depends on what you're going for. I think there's the mechanical sound is kind of in, in in a lot of subgenres, and that's fine. That's just what they're supposed to sound like. But I don't know. Don't 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 do it on everything. At least that's my preference. You know. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the band. If you listen to a Rammstein song and you're like, oh, it sounds like there's keyboards in there. Yeah, there are. Yeah. There are yes. supposed to be keyboards in That's there. That's allowed. But, you know, if you listen to a, you know, if you listen to a Megadeth song and it's like, are those keyboards? It's like, no, no, no. That's uh, actually, I, I didn't even really like the last album, but there were some there's some production things on it, too, where I was like, what does that sound like? What is it? What are they doing? So, yeah. yeah. So um, what, uh, you know, we're concentrating on or we've concentrated on Metroid and, you know, recording, but you've done quite a lot of other stuff, both for fun. And I think you've, uh, you've contributed to some actual game soundtracks too and stuff, right? Yeah. I, um, back in, you know, maybe 2015, 16, I, I started getting uh, just, just because of the number of years I'd been doing the video game arrangement stuff and, and always tried to, to write original music too. I got some opportunities to, to, to play either, session guitar for people or do songs for different things and and just sort of f fell into a few opportunities and my my wife was like you should just see just attempt to go all in like try to see what if this can work and if it doesn't work go get a regular go get another you know desk job like it could it's fine but you know at least, at least she gave it a shot um but yeah i i ended up doing um I played all the guitar on this Cartoon Network show called Steven Universe, which was super cool. I got to, that was sort of like a big session gig and I've gone on to do guitar work for Lena Rain and um, the guys who did uh, Rogue Legacy uh, and some other, it's, it's been really fun to do that. And then for, and then I, I've done a lot of work for Choice Provisions who did like the Bit Trip series, um, done soundtracks for a number of their games. Uh, I, and I ended up doing a um, couple years ago, I did, well, a year and a half ago, I did a soundtrack for a Riot game, a Riot spinoff game for um, League of Legends. They made, they've started making indie games based on their champions. And we got pulled in to do one for this little character called Ziggs. He's like a little sort of a cat looking guy. He's a Yordle. It's a whole, mm -hmm. it's a whole you know, he's a, a character from the League universe and he like duct tapes bombs in his garage. He's sort of an unhinged uh you know sort of sort of unhinged but fun in a fun way character i had to like come up with the, the sound of of zigs like league is a music studio as well and so or, or riot is so then they're always writing themes for their characters but he didn't have one so i had to like write this guy to think about this guy and write a theme song for this guy 
you know, I'm always injecting guitar when I can, but a lot of the stuff I've done for soundtracks has forced me to move other directions. There's more found instrument stuff, synth stuff. Um, so yeah, I've gotten to do a number of game soundtracks. I'm doing another, there's another game coming out very soon called Super Cat Boy, which I got to do some songs for along with Anton Carraza, who's an awesome composer. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making it work, uh, doing other stuff. Uh, and you know, it's, it's freelance. It's like not easy coming from the world where you're used to getting a regular paycheck and it's uh, nine to five, that whole thing. But it's been really, really cool. And it's forced me to, to dabble in things I probably wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I've, I've just finished a short film, uh, my very first short film. So I got to actually co- compose for, the, for to picture, uh, which oh. is like a, which is like a pipe dream of mine. It's a, it's, I don't know when it's going to see the light of day, but I did fit. It's like, it's just a 10 minute piece, but like, I don't know, over the years, things have been slowly evolving. Um, and I'm still trying to do just rock stuff too, but it's, it, I don't know. I've gotten a lot of opportunities and it's, it's made me, it's made me think about things a lot differently. It's definitely made me a better musician. I don't think it's made me a better guitar player because I don't practice still, but, uh, I don't know. It's been really, it's been fun to, to, uh, learn new yeah, stuff I and try to incorporate some of that. I completely disagree with you there because when, uh, when we, the last band that I was in, we could, we just could not find a drummer because the, my partner in there was, uh, an awesome musician from Long Island, but she was a chick. So every time a dude drummer would show up to try out and find out that he was playing a chick's parts and he couldn't play it, his dick would shrivel out into nothing and he'd run out the door. I mean, I'm only exaggerating a little bit, by the way. Like, no, it was I, I weird. It. Like, yeah. as soon as people, <clears throat> I, I just, I don't get that whole it's pretty female silly. male thing. But so we, at one point, we're like, because she wrote also a bunch of like, you know, once again, not to be sexist, but like chick singing on an acoustic guitar type of thing. And I was like, well, look, why don't we just do that for a little while until we find a drummer? And I spent like two months writing those songs with her. But everything was different. How you hold your hands, the position, how you play, yeah. alternating between picking. And then I went back to metal and everything was easier. Everything. Mm, I think yeah. half because those crazy, you know, those muscles with the triplets and everything got to take some time off. But also you're building up all the muscles around it. So I'd be willing to bet that you doing all of this other music, your brain and your muscles are now stronger. And if you just went back and did some crazy prog metal thing that you'd probably find it less less hard than he would have before He's yeah I, hard, but. I think there's some stuff that i could play now live that i have faked in the past that 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 that's for, for sure and i and i think that a lot of it is um i don't i don't i don't practice as much as i as i used to but i do play guitar a lot when tracking i use a lot of i, I cannot i can't read music and i can barely play keys Same. but i use midi uh midi guitar software so i hmm. i bought a midi guitar years ago and it was such a weird fiddly toy thing. I got rid of it, but I run my um, run my guitar through my input effects on, on, on a track and my in my recording software. I, I I put this plugin in there, and it listens to my guitar and translates it into raw MIDI data that I can then play any instrument with. So I could put, you know, I could put orchestra in there. I could do chip sounding stuff. I could you know do a choir or whatever. I can do anything. So even though a lot of the instruments people hear from me may not be guitar, I'm definitely that's my main man. That's my instrument so of choice. Do you, do you know the name of the software that you use for that? Yes, it's called MIDI Guitar Two. It's from a company called Jam Origin. Uh, okay, funny. I was just looking up to make sure that I was going to be talking about the same thing, but I have. Jam Origin MIDI Guitar One that I yeah. bought 2017. Oh boy, is that a lot different than the second version? I bet yeah. you it actually works right. <laughs> it does. It does. There's a lot of um. It's not. It's not like you have a pickup on your guitar that can that is listening to every single string and and then translating. You're listening to the, the entire audio signal. The, the the kind the processing they're doing is pretty amazing. That it can and it can pick up even with even with sort of the natural harmonics and blending and note warble you can get in and when a chord is being played it does a really good job of picking that stuff up i will say there are a lot of false positives so you end up getting lots of little extra midi notes that get thrown around uh when you're recording and it's but that stuff's pretty easy to clean up a lot of them are really short little plucks and little i guess you call them artifacts that just show up when you record and i just have it set so after I'm done recording, I can select all my notes and automatically delete any note shorter than like a, 
64th note or 32nd note, and that kind of wipes all those away. So it, it takes a little bit of um, finessing if you're going to actually use that in the song. But for just messing with ideas, I'll tell you what, if you play your guitar through an instrument that has a really soft attack, you know, something mm. that swells, you play guitar differently. You know, put the, put the cans on so you can't hear your guitar anymore. And you're just hearing this strange instrument and you will approach the instrument differently. Um, totally. You nailed it. And that's fun. what I used to do with it. But as soon as you, with the first one, I'm talking six plus years ago here, but as soon as you got past a certain speed, it just would lose its mind. It wouldn't even, you know, even if you're just, even if I sat there and just hammered all of the notes, tapping it to make sure that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't sloppy. It's still, once you got back in the day, once you got past a certain speed, it didn't like it. Yeah. But all of my friends that have been using it for the past couple of years are like, Oh no, no, it's totally different now. You know, it's really great. So it's got, it's got some, it's got some weaknesses and, and, and I think, you know, in an ideal world, you'd get a guitar with a pickup and a, and a brain, you know, you, something that's, really built for that i would never play with this thing live they always put up oh, videos yeah. of people playing this thing live and i'm like i like no way there's no nah, it's no thank you but uh but for coming up with ideas um especially like non-guitar stuff it's it's really fun and it's and i i keep thinking i'm gonna spend more time with keys with but i'm just not i'm not there i, I just i just resort to playing right now by van halen and then <laughs> and then you know just start smashing smashing keys after that I, I remember playing keyboards when i was a, a little kid and then i mean pre 10 years old and i messed around with it and i was as terrible as you can imagine a 10 year old just messing around to be but every time i've gotten around them uh, you know i could play it but like i mean i'm not good but it sounds like somebody who used to play who's stepping back up versus somebody who actually never really played and i feel like that's just because of my obsessing over guitar for 20 something years that you're just used to using your hands for music yes so you could probably you know you could probably adapt if you ever really needed to yeah i think if i just one of the things i think we don't do as we get older is play like play like a toy play right pick up something and just mess with it at least if and especially if you're in a, if you're in a creative role for your job you're trying to always create you're trying to put you're trying to you put your hands on something with the intent of recording or the intent of making something and you don't as often just pick something up and just make noise and i need to spend more time just playing my little dinky tiny midi keyboard here um because that's how you get better you know that's how yeah, that's um I'm wondering if you, if that's going to be a challenge cuz for me personally, <clears throat> excuse me. Um you know, when I when I really dug into guitar hard, I mean, I mean, when I was a kid obviously and then I continued to play, but I got this job where it was you know, super stressful in that anytime they needed me, I had to be on, I had to be sharp, I had to get it done right away, but it was a lot of sit around and do nothing all day yeah. long, but I had to be in front of my computer from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So that's when I really dug back in and I got creative with the writing and all that stuff. And now with retro RGB for uh, you know, being with the full time job, I love it. It's no complaint. But all of my creativity comes into writing these scripts for these videos and helping friends work on their projects and helping get new products designed. And like every ounce of, of love and creativity in me gets just emptied out. <laughs> and then I go to look at my guitars and I'm like, God, I used to love playing that so much, and I could still I could still play enough where people would be like, "Okay, he's not full of shit." So, but like, I don't know. I like I gotta find a way to to somehow get that desire back to to just be creative through the guitar. Have you ever run into that? You know, especially oh, now doing it full time. All the time. I mean, I think that part of it is the part of it is the music making stuff, but the other part of it is I just don't necessarily want to be in front of my machine. You know, when I'm kind of done for the day, I, I want to step away. I might be in front of another screen, but I'm not yeah. like at my at the rig. Um, but I always have a lot of ideas. I just don't, I haven't found the time to like do that in the evenings. Um, although, the you know, not, it's not always the case. If I come up with a riff idea or something and you just put it down, sometimes you just start going. The, the Same with all the dudes in my family, but we have a, sometimes we have a hard time getting started, but once we get started, we, it's kind of hard to stop, you know? Mm. Um, the, the blank sheet of paper is scary, but once, I, once you get going, then, I, then you just, it, all of a sudden it's 10 p.m. Uh, but that is true, like with a creative, with a, I mean, even if you had a, diff, a job that wasn't creative, sometimes you're just exhausted at the end of the day anyway, and you don't feel like, you know, picking up an instrument or whatever, but 
if you're doing that kind of stuff all day long, sometimes the last thing you want to do at the end of the day is, is, is start over with something else. Um, yeah. Yeah. You got to drive them. You got to drive the, uh, I mean, you could, you could call it motivation, but you got to be inspired too. You know, you got to come up with something that flips a switch in your brain. So you're kind of drawn to it, you know? Um, yeah. You know, my, uh, my selfishness really came in handy with the music uh, writing thing because I never once wrote music because I thought I was going to be a rock star. Like I'm not fucking going to be a rock star. I wrote music with my friends because that's the stuff that I want to listen to sometimes. And that's the only reason I've spent so much time and effort and money on that stuff. And when people like it, cool. When people don't like it, that's fine, too, because it's not for you. It was always for me and, and for us and everything else. So, yeah, that was that was kind of a, a bonus for that one where was, I just got really lucky in that, you know, uh, these are the songs I wanted to hear, at least at the time. Some of them I still really like, too. So. I want to hear I want to hear uh, this stuff. We're going to have to debrief yeah uh, I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards it's you know it's that typical musician thing where it's like well you know it's me playing but it's not the, it's not my guitar sound it's not you know how oh, sure musicians always do that they always try to tell you like well lower your expectations because it's not oh, sure. exactly what i but yeah it's yeah. I, I i dug it I, I definitely dig it awesome yeah i i i have tried to maintain the music for me attitude with stuff um, at least for the stuff that isn't for, for, for work. Like I don't, I didn't do, like I did a Marble Madness record and I didn't do, I, I didn't do that because like the new Marble Madness trailer was dropping, you know what I mean? For the new, the reboot, it was just cause it was on my list of things to, that I had to do. Um, mm. and I, I've tried to keep that going. Like I don't, I, I haven't made myself do something, um, cause I think people might, want to hear it it's it, it, i try to keep that as like more of a personal thing but you know when you're doing but, but when you're doing music for a job it's different it's at that point it is it, it is it's you you know you were pulled in because there's something that you've done that someone might enjoy so you're putting yourself into it but um that's just that's a different situation but i you know i, I don't I, I feel like that is the best way to keep it to, i don't know to keep it fresh and to stay interested is to do the stuff you're interested in you know i i don't there could have, there's probably, there's a million opportunities to have, to have gone down that hole and tried to kind of like catch the wave of whatever's coming around. I've got, a, I've got a lot of friends in my feeds that are, that are, that are riding that and doing well with it, but I hate video. I, I don't, I don't want to do video. I don't, I don't care to go and, and, you know, re record my parts or mine my parts, you know, for this, just cause it's not something I've been, I've, I've been used to doing. I think it's a great way to, to, for guitar players to see kind of what you're doing if it's something weird, but I haven't gotten into that kind of flow and I think I'm okay not being there. Um, you know, I don't know. I have a couple of weird ideas, but I think that a lot of it just comes back to stuff that I just want to do for me. So that's a good, that's a good place to be. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's you. also how I approach retro RGB. Cause if I, you know, Everybody's like, you know, you'd make a lot more money if you did thumbnails like this. And, you know, you, you did a, a video. Why don't you do a video about Raid Shadow Legends? And it's like, but why then why would I do this? Why wouldn't I just go back to getting an IT or development job or go make products out in Asia again and make 10 times the salary and, you know, for less the hours? It's because it's not me. It's also why I'm a terrible businessman, by the way. But <laughs> I, I want to do what I want. But it's a, a, a silly but honest segue into. How did how did you handle that side of things? And I don't mean to get too personal on you, no. but generally speaking, when you have you know we have creative people that try to do things that we love, when it gets time to market yourself and to to get out there and then to deal with all the vultures out there, like you know we'll promote your brand completely for free if you do this entire album for us. Like, how did you handle that? Was it an adjustment, or were you just like, does it come natural to you? I mean. I will also say that I'm a terrible businessman. I will say that I have done, I, I do well enough to be able to take care of myself, but I, but I don't, I have, um, I don't know. I don't market myself very well, especially in the last maybe three, four years. I, you know, I stayed on Twitter for about as long as I could stand. I, I I'm still kind of open it up and, and peek at it, but when Musk went and, and murdered a bunch of companies by cutting off API access, uh, I lost my my app. I lost my Flamingo app. And I was like, well, I guess I'll just open up Twitter and see kind of what it looks like because everyone else seems to use it. 
And it was the worst thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was like a non chronological, uh, uh, po- uh, you know, uh, t- tweet preferred trash fire. And I was like, oh my yes. God, maybe this is a reason to kind of put it down a little bit. So now I'm to the point where I just sort of, I will tweet about things I'm doing. It's more of like a news feed than it is a place to start discussions. Um, but I like personally, I've never, I, I don't know if it's because I don't have a very active channel, but that like, like sponsorships or, um, even like even like content claiming and stuff like that, I never really got into that. And it wasn't because I thought there was anything wrong with it. I just never kind of fell into it. So, you know, that's just not something that's been that's been a problem. Uh, that was too big of a, a thing for me. I, I think that I've been lucky enough that I've I've done this long enough that I do have some people that pay attention to the stuff that I do, which is awesome. And I think that's just probably because I've been doing it so long. Um, I'm not as fresh of a face in the VGM community as a lot of people doing incredible stuff, but there's enough people there that when I put out a word about something that's going on, there are enough people that have heard my stuff before that, that people are paying attention to it. And that's more, more than I could ask for. It's probably not enough attention to be able to garner a, a Raid Shadow Legends sponsorship. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't played it. I see it all the time though. Um, yeah, I've actually never played it either. But I mean, that's part of it. Your work obviously speaks for itself, right? You know, you could have everybody in the world love you and want to hire you. But if you do a shit job, no one's hiring you a second time. So yeah, it's yeah. true. I, I think like I it's for me, it's less about the um, it's less about the numbers and the attention and more about my portfolio, you know, more about like the amount of stuff I've done. I just got a gig. And it was a lead and someone had recommended me, but like I got it because they saw the amount of stuff I've done and the variety of stuff I've done. And that is just a place that it, it's, if, you know, I, I've, I've had a, I had a call with a, um, a student that was doing research about um, sort of how to break into, you know, the interactive media industry. And, and when, when I have that sitting there, it's hard to, you know, there at the position I was in in 2003, right? When I was uploading eight track demos. So they're, they're starting now. And it's hard to know what to suggest for a lot of people that are in that position other than to just freaking make music, like just make tracks or like, you know, it's not money making out of the gate, but f- the things that inspire you the most, you know, you're going to make the best music that way. Find other people that are doing complimentary art or indie games for free and just get on get your songs on some itch games i don't know just go go nuts like be inspired because that's the only that's that's the way i was able to to build up a a library of weird ass music um yeah it's kind of like a chicken and egg double-edged sword thing where it's like whether it's youtube or or music or anything that you're trying to to break into you know the strongest advice is always just do it because you want to do it for fun, do it because you enjoy it, and then just don't even think about the money side until it hits you. But on the, you know, and that's still advice I stick to for anybody asking about it. But on the flip side of things, you know, what are all these companies doing where they need music for their projects or they need artwork or they need, you know, uh, I just, I never understood why it was such an afterthought and such a small part of the budget. I mean, think of some think of some of the best movies you've ever seen, and now imagine them without the soundtracks to them. Oh, I know, without the music, right? Yeah, the exception of the birds, that was badass and that was deliberate. That's fine, but you say the no, birds. Other, other than that, the birds, Alfred Hitchcock, yes. where there's yep. no music in it, yep. that made it so much creepier. But you yep. know, one out of like two million movies, right? Like, come on, so yep. it, it just it, it's weird because I see both sides, right? Don't get into it for the money, but if you're the people. Who, who want it done why aren't you willing to pay for it so, i know i and i don't know luckily there are directors and, and and producers out there that that do feel differently you know i a friend of mine director friend his, his opinion is that sound is 50 percent of the picture like that's yeah. his that's his feeling about it i don't think most people feel that way he feels that way um but i feel like when and you know when you when you're when you're a producer and you're trying to cut corners and stuff it's all i mean game the game audio stuff has been a last has been an afterthought for a very long time um and that's and that's too bad uh yeah. but not in all cases but in a lot of cases so yeah have you seen the movie babylon uh d- i know on the list but no never never checked it out 
so I, I hate spoilers, so there will be no spoilers in this, but I'll just say I've never seen such an absolutely amazing movie that went to shit by the time it hit the end. So that's fair warning. That's no spoilers. I think, you know, I think that's all out there. But the soundtrack to that is phenomenal. And my brother is a producer in Hollywood. And for years now, I mean, I think he might have still been in college. I've been telling him, like, I always thought it would be neat to have a movie that has like a recurring theme. So it's the same notes, but played through different things, played in different styles. So scary parts, it's like the same notes, but like, you know, very creepy. And uh, and I, I gave him an example of it. And he was like, oh, that's cool. And it's almost note for note what Babylon did. Now, I'm, really? I'm obviously not saying Babylon stole my idea. It's uh, parallel thinking. I'm sure there's a million idiots like me that had the same idea, but that cracked me up because I'm watching the movie and I'm like, holy shit. Like, that's that's what I always wanted to do. And they nailed it. And then by the end of the movie, I'm like, oh, how did so many amazing actors not just call it at the end and be like, what are you doing with this? But, I've heard I've that's I've, I've heard that from several people and now I'm actually wanting to see it. Well, I was just wanting to see it out of raw curiosity, but now I want to listen to it. As well. Yeah, no, the the music is some of the best part in it, and then you know the the Margot Robbie just she's she's awesome in everything, but she kills it in that movie. Right you on. know, and they time everything perfectly. The the music really really made it. So yeah, yeah, I'm I'm in a weird I'm in a weird I just like I said I just finished this short film and I'm in a weird movie mode right now where I'm I feel like I'm listening to movies in, a bit differently than I did over the weekend. My wife and I went to uh, Modesto in California and got to see. Um, Empire Strikes Back, where they remove the score and the live symphony plays it. So you're oh. watching Empire Strikes Back with the live symphony. And this is a pretty common thing in a lot of big cities. I'd never heard of it before. A friend of mine, uh, Viking Guitar, got to see it in New York. And so I just looked it up and it was like three hours from us. So we, we went and did it. And it, of course it was great because it's, I mean, you know, it's the, it's the best Star Wars movie with the best some of the best music ever written. Uh, I, I I think it was when you see that happen, it makes you realize when there isn't music. I don't know if it's an easier way to put that. There were 10 minute stretches where there was no music at all. And everyone is just hanging out conductors hands by his sides. Right. <laughs> there are, there are action scenes full of bombast. There are action scenes with no music. There are dramatic scenes with tons of music, dramatic scenes with no music. And I'm like, okay, well, now I have to figure out what the pattern is, right? I gotta like, I gotta like watch. I gotta figure out where, like, where we're trying, where they're trying to push things for. I don't know. It's like a whole different way of thinking than I've had to think about game audio for the last however many years, you know. So that's a yeah. sort of a digression, but it, it's. I feel like that's that's been a really neat thing to. to no, that's not a digression. That's a really cool topic to think about because you know that's something that. You know, even if people are listening to this who just like music and they don't record and they don't maybe don't even play, everybody who's listening to this can picture exactly what you're talking about right oh, now. Yeah. How do you choose where in the in the scene to put the music? Why is it? How many of your favorite movies that you don't even realize that there was music making it better because it just it just amalgamates into this perfect scene that you don't even realize it's all of that stuff going on. So yeah, that's a great point. I think a lot of cheap TV always has music. I don't know if you ever noticed this, but like a lot of the kind of lower budget stuff always has music going. It's always, yeah. it never stops. Change scene, same song, still going. I'm like, <laughs> it, I mean, it feels, but it, it does something. There's psychology there. Is that just like if, if we stop playing music, are you going to turn, are you going to change the channel? Is that, is that, what we're, is that what we're talking about? I don't know. I, well, don't forget too that a lot of stuff today is is really geared towards people with no attention span, and they know that the TV is trash. So that just like, how do we get people to keep this on in the background as opposed yeah. to something else on in the background? Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Secondary. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's a really um, I, the last the last couple projects have been different than just the normal game soundtrack stuff. So it's and that's another. I don't know. So I, I it's been fun to think about audio and on a on a bigger scale like that like how it how it affects people and and do i want in that do i want a part to be a part of that or so or something i don't know to contribute in some way i think it'd be neat i think it would be a whole different kind of challenge so i've talked to people that really that only write for picture and some people can't stand it they hate it and i get it uh as soon as you leave you know the as soon as you leave tempo markers behind or you start having to like wrangle, you know, your projects to account for that stuff or change things after the fact, it gets to be kind of a nightmare, but I don't know. We'll see. 
we'll see. Yeah, I, I hope you stick with it. I hope uh, I hope it's something that, that that just ticks all the boxes for you. Yeah, and you know, and and then as I've been doing this other stuff, I've been I have a lot of new riff ideas and stuff too. Like I have some 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 you know some rhythm guitar experiment experiments I want to get back to. I've just been making time for it. You know, trying to trying to trying to fit that stuff in. Decide how much of my evenings I want to devote to it and things like that. So. Um, so yeah. when you listen to music now, how do you listen to music? Now, obviously, you know, driving around in your car, that's everybody. If, you, if you're going for a jog or a commute, you get your earbuds in. That's, that's kind of standard for everybody. But do you have like a, I want to go listen to music or is that kind of gone because you do that all day long now? Like, is there a thing? Or? It's interesting. Yeah, I, I thought about that more in the last year. I found myself listening to more like podcasts in the car than I was music. Uh, part of it's because my car music, my car stereo is not great. Like I have, the, the, I bought, I got a used car. I had a car thing and I had to get another car and this this one doesn't have the best stereo and that's fine. But I've, I've actually been trying to deliberately listen to just music uh, as my main focus. I used to do it a lot when I was younger I remember coming home, I, my old roommate after I graduated college, uh, I'd always come home from work and he's just sitting on the couch with his arms crossed and listening to a CD. And I, and I thought that was really cool. I was like, I haven't done that since, I don't know, I, my Fisher Price record player when I was little. I don't know. Like I, I don't know when I was just, just actively listening to tunes. And I feel like it's a really different way to experience it. And I've been trying to do more of that stuff. I gave the, I gave the new Foo Fighters record a dedicated listen um, like I, I'm trying to do that, it, although it's hard to sometimes find time for that, but just that there's a, there's a difference between driving your car and listening to music, which all you're doing is you're not doing anything other than driving. So it, it, and a lot of that's sort of automatic, but the difference between that and, and then laying down on the couch and listening to a, to a record is, is huge. Um, yeah. so I'm trying, so I'm trying to do more of that. I'm also trying to listen to my mixes without my monitor on. I had a friend, uh, tip me off to this recently. Uh, on Twitter, but he was just like, I'm trying to like, whenever you, you, you're reviewing a mix, your ears are tired. You're always watching the cursor. You're always watching things go by. He's like, turn your monitor off. Like just turn, just like, or turn around, turn the hell around, stop looking, stop, turn off the optical part of your listening experience uh, and just, and just listen to it. And it is different. Uh, sounds weird, but music fans out there or music makers, give it a shot. It's odd. It's almost, it's actually uncomfortable. Um, cause, cause you're, you're, you're expecting to have your hand on the mouse doing something while that's happening. So, uh, so to answer your question, most of the time I'm driving around or I'm cleaning the house or I'm, it's not all sacred. Most of it is not, but for, for certain things I really liked it. I can, I can tell, you can tell where the, the albums that had the most work. Right. And, um, I, my wife is going to see Beyonce in uh, September. She's super hype about it. She's never, she's never been to a show like that ever, like a big blowout show with lasers and people and conf- i don't know what they got going on sacrifice of some kind i don't know she's <laughs> she's going with her sister and and she's like you really should listen to this new record and i put it on and i was like this is the most amazingly produced thing i've ever seen and so i gave it the dedicated listen i like chill it's not my thing never been a beyonce person she's amazing whatever biggest star in the world and i sat down and listened to that thing and it blew my mind i put like the good cans on it was almost more of like an like a um, academic experiment uh, experience regarding production more than like, hey, check out these riffs or check out these these different but stuff spinning around you. You got people up close. You got people far away. Um, anyway, so a mix of both. But it's funny you ask that because I'm trying to do more of the the more like holistic, you know, just be with the music and see how it, you know see what that's like. For, for different kinds of I've albums. recently started to do something similar and I even did a bunch of analog stuff too just to see how that played into it and it's uh it's not as important I think that's very a lot of it's very hipstery uh there is and I've, I brought musician friends and non-musician friends into this to test but I've absolutely seen a bunch of scenarios where I think what's happening is the whole band was listening to their mixes on cassette in the 80s when they were recording it so if you get the cassette version of it on a good quality cassette and a good quality cassette player, it'll actually sound better than the digital version because that's what they were obsessing over, the total sound. But mm. cassette isn't better than digital. Records aren't better than digital. So if you have something that's somebody took the time to remaster correctly, it's going to be better. 
or you know, like the new In Flames album. I got I got it on cassette, on vinyl, and on digital. It's in Flames did so cassettes. Good. That's yes. crazy. I, that sounds like garbage, though. <laughs> oh well, okay. Well, it's a novelty, that, that right? Was a thing, and the vinyl sounded great, but they just did such an amazing job with the modern production. So the digital version actually sounded the best because that's what they were listening to. Yeah. But I agree in that I do I you know I, I do try to set listening time nowadays and I do also reappreciate the quality of the sound coming from speakers. And I don't mean the sound coming from a hundred thousand dollar speakers. I just mean not shitty speakers. Right. Not the Logitech computer speakers you've been using since 97 actually spending you know 300 bucks on an amp 350 bucks on a set of speakers i mean for under a grand you can get like holy shit good sound that you could have never gotten for that price 15 years ago it's very true that's important to me and my ears were poisoned for a while because one of the jobs I did, I got to go to all the CDA shows, CES, a bunch of home automation stuff. I've been in the rooms with a half a million dollar stereo and it's good. Yeah. It's real good. There was one where yeah. I, if you closed your eyes, you would bet somebody every penny that you had in your bank account that there was a woman standing in front of you 10 feet away singing. And but it wasn't. It was just two of the best speakers and the best amp I've ever heard in my life. So I don't. I don't even want to hear those anymore. I don't want to. I, I just want to stick to affordable stuff that sounds amazing that I could recommend to other people. And I, I it, that's that alone has been a huge difference in listening. It's just, you know, these earbuds I got for podcast recording. Don't. I will never listen to music through these ever, ever, ever. Yeah, it's you know, as a as an engineer, you have to account for those scenarios. But I, I certainly don't enjoy listening if I forget my earbuds and I'm 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 throwing the ones on the plane. It's like the worst thing in the world. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, yeah. If you're gonna make time for music, you need to you need to create an environment for it. You know, people don't skimp on chairs anymore. You're sitting all day long. You're getting good chairs. Get some good cans or get some good speakers and put on your favorite records. If if you if you get a really good set of speakers or headphones, you will re-listen to albums you haven't listened to in a long time, and they'll sound totally new. Oh, um, you nailed it right there. It's a hundred percent true. 100%. Yeah, I just got the. These are my new. It's gonna work great on audio, but I just got these guys. Uh, uh, I made an investment and I got these cans. Um, they're called LCD X's and I got them used. I got a decent deal on them, but they were like, I decided to look into doing, I was trying to decide if I wanted to upgrade my monitor setup or my headphone setup. And I, because my wife works next door a lot, I decided to go for that more than the, um, than the, just the standard, uh, monitor setup just cause the they don't have a smaller room Aud- anyway. What's that? Audis LCD X. Audis. Yeah. Yeah, I just looked that up. It's a fancy pair of headphones. I did right not pay. There. I did not pay that price for those headphones. I paid <laughs> about okay. half that. I paid about half that. I I hate spending money. I really do. But believe it. But even with even with that, I like. I do not regret these at all. Like I feel like it, I I was mastering a crazy kind of industrial um, uh, cyberpunk album concept mm. album, and the low end is wildly important on this record. And I, and I have a bit of resp- I have a bit of I have a few low end problems in my studio, but I. I was really looking into, into these and, and I was like, can you wait another week for me to finish this? Because I want to get these freaking headphones and make you my guinea pig. And it ended up being the best decision I, I've, I've made. These, these things like, you know, it doesn't matter as much for music, but you can, I can do a sweep down to like 20 hertz and actually feel these things in, on my head. Like it really, it really is insane. Um, and I mean, that's just, that's impressive. But I, I will say I've gone and like I've, I've got some record player problems, but it works for the most part. And I've gone back and gone through a bunch of LPs with these things. Um, but it's like it, when you set yourself up to enjoy audio, you want, you want to experience it. Like you want to spend time with it. I mean, even if you're just getting like a set of new noise canceling headphones, the first thing you want to do is just start listening to your favorite stuff to see how it sounds. So, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah, re- rediscovering music that you may have liked at one time. Because, <clears throat> you know, I, I loved going out and finding, I still like finding new music. So I'm not one of those grumpy old men that only wants to listen to the same 20 things I listen to forever. But uh, Warren G's first album. I wanted mm. to, I wanted the song Regulate because I always loved that song. I wanted to do my cassette player song. test with it. This is a great song. But the rest of the album, every song is good. Every mm. single one. And I forgot how good those were. 
and I, I I bought that cassette with the purpose of like, well, let me do my my analog audio testing so that I could probably do a, a write up or a video on it. And I I listened to it twice in a row, the whole album. I couldn't mm. believe how good it was. I had forgotten most of those songs. So. I've I heard you mention in previous uh, episodes about the the kind of digital audio or d- digital analog thing. I haven't done as much like a being between uh, CDs and and vinyl or tape for that matter in in, like lot, like in real time, right. Bouncing back and Mm -hmm. forth between the two. Uh, I really want to, um, I feel like I need to do it with the actual, I feel like I need to do it with the actual needle on the record and not like record it to tape and then play it back. But I guess if you do it as a super high bit rate or not bit rate, but high uh, resolution, maybe that would be okay. But, theoretically if you did thir- like 24 bit 192k and i know yeah. i know vinyl is nowhere near that but there are so many things that are part of the experience that you um that your body and your brain senses even if your ears don't hear it yeah um but so i i don't think i've i've admitted this publicly yet but the oh, reason i got i got super into this was because the whole thing with you know CRT displays and old video games and old TV shows and old movies, they look better on those and on projectors sometimes. So I'm trying to find a way to get all of that content to look as good as it can, as close as it can to that on modern displays because your average enthusiast would go through the trouble of getting all that crap I have back there, but not your average person. Whereas if your average person could say, wait, so I just buy this thing for a couple hundred bucks, plug it into my TV, and it's going to look like that? Most would. Most that actually care. So I was trying to do the same with audio, but affordable. Because mm. anytime you walk into one of these high-end places, and they're like, oh, of course, we can make digital sound just like it. Spend $9,000 on this, 22000 Yeah, go fuck yourself. I'm right. pretty sure... I'm pretty sure we can make this happen for definitely under a grand, but maybe under 500. So I wanted to start out with a baseline of knowing, like especially knowing which albums I could listen to and immediately just be like, that's the cassette, that's the vinyl, that's the digital, here's why, here's... And then I'm, uh, I've been talking to a couple of friends about making preamps or you know you plug your raspberry pi into this so you stream from your phone to the pi but through the amp thing and... So hopefully in 2024, you might see a product come out that's actually affordable that would make music, all music sound the way it kind of was supposed to. You just have to choose, like make it sound like a vinyl, make it sound like a cassette, make it, and it's not going to be exactly the same, but I guarantee at the very least for the examples that I've been testing, any, anybody who doesn't hate that style of music would go, oh, I get it. Definitely. I mean, if you play a song that you hate, you you play a song you hate, obviously, but, you know. Let me ask you a question. If you take, like, the old chips, the old, like, console um, hardware, we we always talk about the ideal listening environment, right? Right. What what is the ideal listening environment for that chip? Is it through the, the, the shittiest Zenith wood panel covered speaker out of the front of your CRT? Because that, because that's what everyone everyone that heard that when i was little is what that's what they heard it out of what is the ideal listening environment for that era? so what you're asking is exactly the same as when people say what's the best way to play an old video game is it through composite or rf yes, on some right. shitty tv is it through rgb through a broadcast monitor that was fifty thousand dollars when it was new and unfortunately the answer is whatever you like Right. And I know people get really mad when I say that because they want an answer that they could follow. But the there are so many good ways to do it, but there's there's a couple of bad ways to do it. And I have a feeling that's going to be the same. Because it's exactly like it's exactly like if you say, Oh, when you grew up listening to your favorite album, you had that really shitty over ear headset that came with whatever knockoff brand cassette player you bought. So is that the authentic way to listen? No. Of course not. Absolutely not. But do you also want to put it through a digital processor, through crazy expensive speakers, especially stuff like, you know, like, you know, imagine the first uh, Metallica album, right? Basically recorded on a four track. I know it wasn't, but it's a good metaphor for it. Right. You know, you don't want to put that. Are you going to put that through the most expensive stereo? No, but you also don't want to listen to it with your crappy headphones on. So I think the answer is a happy medium in that you just you don't want to try to change it into something it's not, but you you want to embrace the fact that everything is cheaper to do quality now than it was back then. 
So yeah, interesting. Because I just think about this idea of like running, running this product or whatever, running through filter amp filters. Like what what the end goal is, like what the end state is, and maybe that's maybe it's something where it has different settings to create different character to to emulate different. Thing. And the reason there's only one, there's not only one CRT filter on these emulators is because everyone, it was all, it was all different. Like it was all right. different stuff back in the day. Um, so it's, I mean, same for audio too. I've never really thought about that, uh, but that's fascinating. Uh, but I yeah, just know that it, listening- it's a strange rabbit hole because you could very easily just go off and make a thousand different plugins and none of them actually do what you originally intended on them doing. You're just like, hey, listen to all these cool ways I could filter your audio to do different things. So yeah. that's why both with the CRT filters and the, you know, the retro tank 5X and with the audio stuff that we're kind of playing around with and still basically just barely prototyping, it's we're trying to very strictly keep it to a a good representation because you know, the better example I could use, because for whatever reason, it's so much easier to describe visual things than audio. But if, if you looked with like a microscope at a CRT and I created a filter that made it look exactly like that on an LCD panel and you step back normal distance, you'd look at the LCD panel and go, that doesn't look very good. But if I make a filter that, that five feet away looks like the CRT. You're going to go, holy crap, that looks just like that, you know, the CRT I have sitting in the corner. And it's kind of like that with audio. You you don't actually want to recreate all of the noise. You want to get the warmth and you want to get the way that that noise would tie it together. So uh, a, a buddy of mine, Maddie, Miss Mad Lemon, she her album from last year, she did it all on an Amiga. And it's uh, it was recorded through a, a real Amiga and everything. And I loved it. It's a great album. But I then took that album digitally with an MD4A approved audio card. And I put it on a cassette using a Nakamichi Dragon cassette player and then played it back on the mm. cassette. And it was just like, there were so many things. And I, I talked to her about that. We should have recorded that as a podcast. But I talked to her about that offline. And I was pointing out things like, hey, this sound effect that sounds like a crackle, when it was on a cassette, it actually sounded like an instrument. And it blended in with these other things at the same time. But then the noise of the cassette kind of made these two things not sound as good as the digital. And so it was it was really interesting to, to kind of break it down that way. I wish I took audio samples of all of this stuff so I could be not just describing it, but playing it. For sure. People. Did you, so you said you, you, you think, you, could you say that you maybe enjoyed some of it more and some of it less? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Cool. Some stuff just kind of hits your ears in a way. Cause even though I'm approaching old man status, my ears are shockingly still really good. My eyes are right. unfortunately going first, but uh, so I could, a lot of stuff I was like, Oh, that kind of hit my ears different, but a lot of other things, you know, I'd listened to this album 50 times already at this point, just casually. So I'm like, Oh wow, that sounded really good like that. Hmm. So I got to try to find a, a happy balance and you know have a and all do it in a device that's easy to use and people could actually afford to buy. It's always so hard. So. I was down and uh, visiting a friend recently, uh, and he's a bit of a he's got a stack of amps. He's a bit of an auto audiophile guy, and he's got some some uh, dual Famicoms he's trying to do work on. And he's 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 one he's fam. Right. He's fam. But he's got this like um it's a it's a it's a standard Sony broadcast monitor. Is it a Trinitron? What is it called? It's the tiny little one. It's like probably uh yeah, and it's probably says uh PVM or BVM on it, depending. It's a broad okay. you know, yeah. Um and he and I got to play Super Metroid on it, and it was like the prettiest thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. It was absolutely just amazing. And I would love to know what the equivalent is for the audio coming out of that. Maybe not Super Metroid, but like not sample based, but like the chip era. I'm just curious. I'm just curious, like what that interpretation would be. You know, so probably my, is my, probably is uh, something uh, terrible, like a tiny little speaker on a television, right? You know, my opinion on this. This is not fact. This is just an opinion. Is you want an audio solution that's good enough to highlight all the things you love but not so good that all you hear is like, well, these are samples from a 16 bit console back in 1994. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and same with the more abrasive chip stuff from earlier. Like I, I, I I get why some people don't actively listen to some of those tracks unless they're helped because it is, it can be an abrasive experience, especially on Mm. certain machines compared to others, but it's not as easy as just rolling off your high end. You know what I mean? Like there's, 
there's more going on. I don't, I don't know. I, the whole thing is fascinating to me. Um, are you I, familiar with Sam Miller's work? Why do I know that? I know that. I feel like so I know he that took name. The, he found all of the original samples used for Super Metroid and for a couple of other games. And he created an MSU1 audio soundtrack of Super Metroid. So you're listening to it and it's got the samples pre-compression before they were compressed to fit on the Super Metroid. Oh. So that's the type of thing where it's like you listen to that, you listen to it on the best stereo you could afford. It's oh, like, of course. Holy yeah. Crap good. I have not, I don't know. I haven't, I'm not, I'm unfamiliar. Is that something I can find easily? I will send you all of this. So, do you know about MSU on audio hacks and all that stuff? I don't know. Not, no. Mm-mm. So, there was a developer that unfortunately passed a while back that basically, the I'm going to skip to the end. Fans of this developer are going to be annoyed with me for it. But it was the concept was what if the Super Nintendo CD actually came out? So how could you inject CD quality audio into Super Nintendo games? So people then figured in the the Zeldix forum figured out really a, a, a obsessed with it in a good way and started doing things like all right here's Link to the Past with the orchestral soundtrack here's Super Metroid with the Metroid Metal soundtrack to it people actually did oh, that by the yeah, way yeah yeah funny yes, enough familiar. I love listening to Metroid Metal. Didn't like listening to it while I was playing the game. It was weird. It was oh, just no, like, a, that's, no, that I want to be headbanging to this. Not, that you didn't know. surprise me at all, actually. But yeah, no, that's that's cool. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, so it's there's a lot of stuff like that. So you could do things like make a very high quality digital recreation of the original samples and then play that through the game. And uh, you could use, there's a couple of software emulators that do it. And then the Mr. FPGA project is probably the easiest way. Yeah, so if you're right. into old games and, you know, if you need one of those, let me know. I could get you hooked up with all that stuff. Oh, I, that's gosh. I've always I, like once a month, I think about going down the rabbit hole and then I stop myself. I'm trying to like, again, I'm watching my funds. I'm a musician for a living, but boy, oh boy, there it is. I'm oh, getting no. new prototypes next week. This is the last prototype. Oh so yeah, I'll be able to, to uh, I'll, I'll hook you up. Don't worry. I, I got you covered. So, oh man. And the, the, that prototype is the one that th- there's a different audio chip in there. So if you want analog audio out, it's actually a decent DAC in there. Really? But you can also just get digital audio if you have your own DAC that you prefer. So. Yeah, interesting. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I hate saying that I don't know about something that is probably the most obvious thing to most of your listeners. So, hey. No, 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 you no, know. no. It's, <laughs> Yeah. No, it, it, this is one of these things where if you don't follow the scene, there's no reason, there's no way for you to know it. You can't walk into a game store and buy a mister. So, it's, yeah, there, right. you know, this is... exactly. Yeah, this is weird territory here, but no, I'll get you hooked up and I'll also I'll make sure to hook you up with some of the MSU one stuff so you could and I, I got to put the Metroid Metal one on there just for the fuck of it. But oh, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, sure. Of course, <laughs> it's an experience. It's definitely cool. And it's it's also interesting because sometimes it's like, oh, well, uh, like Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. They did the same thing for Genesis. So you could listen to the original Michael Jackson songs on it. But I kind of liked the, you know, the digital chip tunes if you want to call it that version of it but then you yeah. have stuff like here's mortal Kombat for the genesis but with the arcade soundtrack hooked up to it it's like oh, oh interesting. okay yeah. that's that's actually an improvement but yeah i'll see if i can get you all taken care of for one of those that way you could uh, go down oh, that man. rabbit hole <laughs> oh man fun yeah there's i always hear about that stuff sort of like proxy either buddies in in a different discord or a podcast talks about it because someone's an enthusiast someone's in the zone and doing nothing but trying new cores or whatever but i have yet to take the plunge i i tend to get i tend to fall slip pretty quickly into rabbit holes so i i also try to avoid them if i can um but this is always this this stuff's just this is awesome this is stuff i've always been interested in so and oh, the cool. thing that I also really like about Mr. is uh, Artemio's MD Fourier project. The whole thing was trying to make sure that both hardware and software emulation could actually reproduce the sounds properly. Yeah, and that's years, it's, gosh. Yeah, it's the first thing to go. You know, right? It, it's, I, I, maybe it's not, but it feels that way to me. Like I, no, it definitely is because yeah. for years, how would you know? You have to find members of the community with really good ears who are willing to painstakingly go through and see if the emulation is correct. And there's only so many aces and firebrand X's in the world. And when Artemio came up with this and you're able to recreate the exact 
audio of the original, that was a huge game changer because yeah. now it's down to these graphs where you can't even hear the difference with the human ear, but they're getting it, you know, to exactly the same. So wow. not every core on the Mister is like that, but the, you know, the ones that you would hope for are Genesis, yeah. you know, Super Nintendo is kind of getting there, NES, PC Engine. So, yeah, very cool. I was actually just talking, to, I know JMR was on your show a couple months ago or, or whatever. Mm. I was just talking to him about my first he's like the biggest gimmick dude in the world as you know and he um we were I, my first gimmick experience was actually playing it with some friends on an emulator sort of all of a sudden one night we just decided to try it and realized we had been playing we played through like four levels and we're like man something's something's up and we I, we didn't i wasn't even familiar with the soundtrack as much then now it's like an all-timer for me but at the time we're like something's weird and he went into settings and flipped a few switches and it was like the whole thing lit up because of this because and that was just a that was just a it wasn't even a bad emulator it was as much as it was just a few things not being set up right but it was not the turning thing. on the famicon disk system emulation exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> and then it t- i had, I knew that baseline by heart and then all of a sudden all the rest of the stuff turned on it was it was a fun experience but yeah audio man is always the first one first thing to get you know someone's or it's a device with some built-in stuff and i don't know i just hate i hate hearing it's always like, it's always a Mega Drive game, and in the first like thirty seconds, you're like, oh, God, it's, you're just, it's just a mess. It's absolutely, and maybe some people can't notice. Maybe there's like, maybe the the stuff that's off is just a little off, and but I feel like the people who are playing those things, the enthusiasts, will yeah. definitely notice. You know, what I've found is that tone deaf people are tone deaf. It's not an insult. It is what it is. So I'm colorblind, so it's, fine. it's just a thing. And people that have an ear for music notice immediately and people that don't have an ear for music, if you played, if they're playing emulation and then you play them the original, they'll go, oh, wow, that sounds different. Mm -hmm. But you have to point it out to them, but they would absolutely notice the difference. Yeah. No, something's something is something has changed. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So uh, what's what's next on your plate that you could talk about? I'm sure you're you're working on stuff that's still you know not released yet and all that. But. Yeah, there's a. I know that I know that uh, I believe later in the summer, Super Cat Boy is a platformer you can wish list on Steam that I've got some songs in with my buddy Anton Caraza and one of the developers, the artists actually did some music in the game as well. Um, that's coming. I got another game that hasn't been announced that should be out maybe in August, maybe maybe September. I actually don't know um that i'm cranking on um oh gosh that's just i'm trying to think if there's any see this is what happens when you just start doing work doing songs for your job is you're just like you just say a bunch of i can't talk about it shit and sound like a jerk but no, that's it's just every what week it is. Of my life i feel your pain yeah it's what it's how it, it's how it is and I, I mean i'm doing some i'm doing some neat stuff i'm doing i will say i'm doing a you may find this interesting i'm doing a project um it's not a video game, but it is for a, it is for an interactive, it's, it's interactive media in some way. And, but it is on dedicated hardware. I'm actually going to get, I'm actually designing for a, for a um, five speaker stereo, five speaker stereo, five speaker setup. Mm -hmm. So it's the first time I will have designed for something that will always sound the same wherever it's played or wherever it's interacted with. I don't know if that makes sense. You know, you got to design for your car. Because you're it's, not it's yeah, different. It's very not different. Album where you're putting your phone on a table, thinking, "All right, how's it going to sound when people listen to it like this? Or how's it sound in my shitty car? How's it sound in my yep. good?" Having a dedicated thing, man. Yeah. So, are it, you like, are you nerding out and using tricks? Like, all right, well, when you're sitting in this thing, then the audio bounces this way. So, I'm going to make an effect that goes like, "Are you my like, hope? Oh, my, that? my hope is that that is the kind of stuff that I, that it's sort of getting rolling now. But that's what I'm hoping for. It'll. It's less of a the five speaker system isn't really like a surround thing necessarily. It's more of like a low mid high situation, but there's a lot of audio fidelity to work with there. So like twinkle things should twinkle appropriately. And I don't know how the stereo field is going to feel with this setup, but it's, it, it's just peculiar. Cause it's not, you know, when I did, I did this soundtrack for card of darkness, which was an Apple arcade game. I found the, I found the EQ profile of like the iPhone, what the hell was that? I don't know. iPhone nine speaker or whatever it was, whatever was out at the time. And like, you know, had it as in my monitoring chain on my computer. So I, with a click of a button, I could, and then I would pan everything to, to the left so I could stare at my left monitor and it sounded like an iPhone. I actually used a, a buddy's iPhone to test it. It was pretty close. I made my left monitor sound just like an iPhone so I could try and design audio 
for the people that refuse to wear, you know, good headphones with their their phones. So that's the kind of stuff you have to jump through when you're doing audio for a game or whatever else. Um, but yeah, this will be this will be neat. This is like a dedicated hardware setup. That's not that's not uh, that's different for me. So that'll be cool. It will be challenging in different ways. I think um, there are standards I probably need to kind of kind of work toward and, and ways to make it work but anyway yeah the sub is going to be what the sub is and that's what i have that's what i have to work with don't go too low or i don't know it, it'll be fascinating but um that's a lot of fun can't and then again I'm, I'm a jerk and i can't say anything about what it is but i will soon yeah no it's fine it's not being a jerk it's the opposite how much of a dick would you be if you outed a project that hasn't yeah. even been released yeah. yet right yeah, <laughs> that's, that, that's a bigger oh, okay. that's a bigger jerk that's for yeah, sure yeah you're fine you're totally fine <laughs> Um, is there one or two places that people could follow all of your work? Do you have a website that you maintain? Is there one social media site you hate less than the rest? Is there? <laughs> yes. So I will say that um, my I try to keep my my I have a portfolio on my website that I try to keep updated. All the stuff that's trickled out. Not I do a lot of mixing and mastering and and stuff to engineering work for other people, and I haven't kept that up quite as much. Um, but I do have a discography on my site that lists sort of stuff in order that's pretty updated. Twitter is what I use mostly for just tweeting new things, retweeting things. I use I do Facebook on occasion too. Never really got to I have an Instagram, but I don't really use it. Uh, um, so, and that, so those are kind of the main places. Um, I, I've been wanting to do more of a mailing list uh, thing, but I just never really uh, haven't really been as much on that. So, um, but yeah, so those are the main spots that I'm I I post things. Um, keep my link tree updated with stuff, that kind of thing. It's like what you, what people expect from most musicians and try to keep, I'm actually going through the process of uploading a lot of old stuff that never made it to streaming platforms. So once every couple of weeks, I'm throwing a new song up on Spotify. Um, mm. I did an Inciferum cover with my wife. It's like a kind of a folk metal band. We did for a, a song for a buddy and we uploaded that a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of like VGM stuff, licensable VGM stuff that I have that is just kind of like buried in old, ba old band camp albums that aren't even on my band camp, you know, and I'm sort of pulling those out and talking to the, to the producers of those records and trying to like put stuff, you gotta be where people are. Right. And a lot of people are streaming. Yeah. So I want people to be able to find that stuff if they like, uh, if they like a certain song and I, I want to be in front of that search, you know, so it's been fun to pull up some of the old stuff and, and get it out on streaming. And if people want to support your work, do you have a Patreon? Do you have like a band camp where people could buy your albums? I've definitely bought at least one Metroid metal album. Probably. Yeah, there are, there is a, the, the, the obviously stuff's on streaming, but band camp is probably the best way to support me. I don't really do, uh, I haven't done Patreon just because I haven't had like a, I haven't figured out any sort of routine um, sort of perks that I think would be of, of, of value or that I can kind of keep up with regularly because I'm doing so much for higher work these days. I'm doing less sort of for fun stuff month to month. So no Patreon, but if you want to go back and buy a Bandcamp record or a lot of them more pay, pay what you want to. So if you want to throw me some burger money, I won't complain. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to lie for a lot of musicians when they have that pay what you want, I will download it for free and I will listen to it. And if I don't like it, I just, you know, I just feel like an asshole saying it, but I just, it's not my thing. So I don't pay. But if I like it, I will absolutely go back and throw 10 bucks or something like that. Yeah, wow. absolutely. I've listened to this album five times in the past week. It's well worth it. My 10 bucks. Here you go. Have at yeah. it. Please keep making more. So no, I hear you. You know what I'll do a lot of times too, is I'll go buy a record from a buddy and then I'll just go stream it on Spotify. So like, because it's there, like it's yeah. where I listen to some stuff so I can throw it on a playlist of new VGM stuff or buddy music or whatever, um, which is hilarious. But it's my way of kind of supporting them and then going to the platform that I end up on more frequently. I, don't, I haven't enjoyed Bandcamp's uh, app as much. Um, here's a funny one for you. I decided to do pay what you want merch at a show. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's like... Maybe it's just this scene. I think the video game music scene is just extra supportive. But I think when someone walks up to your booth and they see pay what you want, you can watch their brain sort of short circuit. You know, you don't they don't know what they're supposed to do. Like they may not have a lot of money, but they don't want to be a jerk, but they would like a CD. Um, and so, you know, the whole idea is you pay something. It could be anything. It could be a dollar or whatever. For every person that gives you a buck for a CD, someone will throw you 20. Because it's like, because they find that the pay what you want idea is a generous uh, proposition to begin with. And they have a $20 bill. You know what I mean? So 
I don't know for any bands out there uh, that want to try something crazy at a show, any of the video game music nerds that are manning their own booth, uh, give that a try one night just as an experiment. Keep keep a keep an Excel sheet handy and see if it works out. But it ended up averaging about the same. It was like, you know, 10 bucks a CD, 15, 20 a shirt, something like that. Um, um, I'm friends with the band Answer Infinity and a couple of their shows, they brought USB sticks because yeah. some of their one of their i think the first show that we played together they were selling cds and i was like what the fuck am i gonna do with that yeah i know i know Just give I know. you the money and you email me a link to where i could download it you're yeah. gonna make me go home put that thing in my computer rip it to my hard drive put it on my phone can't you just and my aj the guitarist is a really good friend of mine and he's laughing i was like why don't you get some cheap ass usb sticks so people could actually use it for things after and he did and they sold they all sold oh that's <laughs> cool yeah that's that's it's, it's a way you don't put up barriers between people and your music i, I yeah. know i know people that like you don't have cds you know they kind of want it because they're, they're still used to make that's like their default to support someone and then they have a library of things they can put up but they're not useful anymore my, my wife's car doesn't have a cd player this the cars are dictate your media habits in a lot of ways and the death knell already happened for cds and so it's like well what do we do i could i could get prints made put qr codes on the back with links to records or Bandcamp codes i mean there's i guess there's stuff you could do but you you want people like buying something people like taking something home i like it uh you know I, i'll grab a vinyl if i can um but those yeah. are cost prohibitive so yes, you know <laughs> no there is no pay what you like for vinyl there, heck no a minimum <laughs> no absolutely yeah awesome that's the truth well grant thank you so much for doing this man I, i'm sorry if i just geeked out the whole time because this is a trip talking to you i've been listening no to it's fun for it's 15 fun. years now so it's fun to it's fun to, to rant and chat tech and music and no it's great love lo- love the site and and it's a great to be able to connect with you man Thank you very much. Well, I will obviously put links to everything that you talked about in the description. And, uh, you know, you everybody better believe I'll be uh, doing write-ups whenever your next project comes out. So thank you right again. Right on.